When it feels like I'm hiding under a rock, I'm hiding under my rock. I seek and I hide, I'm too weak to speak in the stillness of prayer. There's no secrets, God already knows. My longing, my yearning, my groaning, my burning, my scars and my hurting. It's no surprise to him, it's watchful I see it. I'm only fooling myself when I conceal it. Apart from grace, I would never seek your sovereign face. Next to you, the only place to keep my heart chased. Otherwise, I chase idols to my disgrace and waste time trying to fix what I can only break. It's when I'm broken that I'm standing open handed, reaching out to my Father, knowing you understand me. In your arms, I can safely rest. You're the God who gives life from death. None of this is wasted. Still becoming who we are. Ordinary people, extraordinary scars from a million faces, like a million shooting stars. We belong to hope now, and heaven isn't all that far.
in 45 minutes. Think positive, Frank. Oh, you be positive. I'll be realistic. Heather, did you count heads? 11, including me. Five boys, six girls, four parents, two drivers, and a partridge in a pear tree. Did you lock up? Yeah. Did you close the garage? That's it. I forgot to close the garage. That's it. No, that's not it. What else could we be forgetting? Kevin! 
In Home Alone, the McAllisters forget Kevin. They're on the plane before they realize that he's gone. Now, I don't know about you, but I forget things all the time. I've forgotten keys. I've forgotten my drink. I've forgotten, I don't think kids yet so far, but I remember one particular time where I was really in a hurry to go get groceries. I was taking the kids with me. I went through the whole process of shopping at the store, got to the cash register, cash register and realized that I'd forgotten my wallet. So I had to pack everything up again, come home to get the wallet and then go back out again. Thankfully, I remember the children in my rush. But all of us, I think, have forgotten things because we're in a hurry. And the truth is, if we're not careful, our whole lives can be in a hurry. And that's what our whole series is about. Is he, Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. It's hard to love well when we're in a hurry. It's hard to be present to people when we're in a hurry. And so we're going to kind of unpack how hurry can damage our spiritual lives and what we can do to slow down and practice the life that Jesus says we can have in him. So we're going to be looking at some particular spiritual practices practices over the next four weeks, but especially today, we're exploring just the problem, the problem of hurry sickness that we think we don't have, but Megan is going to help us understand perhaps is more prevalent than we realize. So that's what's coming up today. She'll be up in a minute to, to preach to us, but there are a few announcements I wanted to make you aware of as we're heading forward this week. The first is that we're we're broadcasting these services on YouTube. So if you're watching this video right now, hey, you found us. That's awesome. If you found us through the Facebook link, you're right where you're supposed to be. You're right in this Sunday's playlist. If you happen to go directly to YouTube through an app or on your phone or through uh, a device like an Xbox or a PlayStation, there's a decent chance that you just clicked on the premiering video when you got to the Damascus Road page. I'm going to encourage you right now if you need to. What I'm saying, you know, is important, but I'm telling you what to do right now. Um, and you can switch this because we set up a whole playlist every Sunday so that the message will go right into the curated worship playlist that we have. So I encourage you to make sure when you go to YouTube, if you're searching directly YouTube and not going through the Facebook link, that you go to this Sunday's playlist, which will ensure that you will worship with us directly afterwards instead of having to fumble around after the message like I've done a couple times. So if you need to, if you need to do that right now, I'll talk for another second and you can do that and make sure that you're in the playlist before I move on to other announcements because there are a few other things we want you to know. So next up is that it's important that you know how to find us on either Facebook or Instagram because throughout this series, like I said, we're going to be unpacking some spiritual practices and we're going to be posting every week the teachers are doing special videos to help you understand a spiritual practice that you can do that week that relates to their message. So make sure that you follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook so you're aware that we're posting these videos or just go look this week and find a spiritual practice that Megan Stippich will prepare for you to engage with God this week. We also have our mobile food bank coming up this Saturday. There's a chance to pack boxes on Friday to help us provide food for people who are who are at risk right now during COVID and really just in general, more people are food insecure than we realize. So if you're interested in packing boxes, you can email Megan Stibrich. Or if you want to help on Saturday, actually, you just also email Megan Sibrich because she's the person who's in charge of the mobile food bank. We encourage you to pack a box, volunteer, or just come get food. We always have a few extra boxes. And if you are in any way thinking, man, I need to go grocery shopping, or I could go get a box, just come by and get a box. It's every third Saturday at the Christian Challenge building, which is Tyndall. It's right on Tyndall, right next, just west of campus. So come grab a box. The last thing that we have for you to be aware of is that we have an art club that happens every month. We encourage all of our community to participate in joining God in the creative process, whether that's writing a song or a poem, taking photography. My children draw things for this every time. So I'm going to be honest, the standard doesn't have to be high. The goal is just to participate and share your creativity together. So whether it's it's a song or just a thought that you had. We encourage you to share with our art club. Devin Brankle is on staff with us, curates that for us. And this month's topic is time and space. What about time or space inspires you? So we encourage you to participate in the art club this month and share with our community what God's been doing in you and just some of the creativity he's gifted to you because we are all creative and we're making these lives together. And when we practice, we enjoy it and get it even better. So I encourage you to engage with that this month. Those are the announcements we have today. Let me pray as we move into a time of worship through teaching. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for the chance to gather together, to consider the pace of our lives. And COVID has slowed down a lot of things, but there's such a desire to get back to normal. And one of the challenges is normal's maybe not always good. 
What are the ways that our hearts are, are out of rhythm, that aren't settled in you? Help us to learn to rest in you, to find true life in you and the practices of Jesus so that we can have the life that is truly life that he promises us. May our hearts be open and your spirit minister to us as Megan speaks this morning. It's in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here this morning for the start of our new series. So about six years ago, I was in a pretty serious car accident on the freeway. And given that our series is about hurry, you might be thinking, ah, this is going to be a story about Megan speeding or being distracted on the road. But you would be incorrect. I actually wasn't even the one driving. My friend May was. And our accident was a lot more about a semi-truck drifting over into our lane and May swerving to avoid it than anything to do with someone speeding or being distracted on the road. We ended up spinning out of control, bouncing off of the semi-truck, and then ending up on the shoulder of the freeway. And it was absolutely terrifying. I very much thought I was about to die as we were out there spinning around on I-10. And when we found ourselves on the side of the road with minimal injuries, it was honestly amazing. And while I wasn't physically injured in any serious way, I, looking back, was not mentally okay. At one point, I went back to the car to get our bags out of the back seat so our friend Ryan could come pick us up and take us home. But I couldn't even open the back door of the car because the car had been crunched in and the door was now stuck. So I opened the front seat and then I saw all the chips. So we'd brought this bag of Gardetto's snack mix along with us as, you know, just a snack for the road. And in the midst of the car spinning around and bumping into things, it had become open and flung snack mix everywhere. And my first thought upon seeing this was, oh no, I made a huge mess in May's car. I got to clean that up. And I proceeded to spend several minutes painstakingly picking up pretzels and rye chips from among piles of broken glass from the windows of the car. In my brain's attempt to not go into a full crying panic over my accident, my internal reaction was completely illogical. Clean chips from a clearly totaled car. And it's a funny image to think of now, but in the moment, it was a clear sign that I was just responding to the immediate circumstances around me and not really being present to what was happening or what I was feeling after the car accident. And now, this strange clean all the chips response was because stress and shock do super weird things to our brains. And so while trying to pick up Gardetto's from a pile of broken glass in a messed up car is not the most rational response to a near-death experience, it does make sense in the context of a high-stress, high-adrenaline situation where my brain was trying to process a lot of stuff at once and just make decisions. But the thing is... I just don't think that's the only time in my life that I've reacted like that. Not just like in this really extreme situation, but in everyday normal things. I have found myself so stressed over everything that I think I need to get done that I just freeze. I can't get started and I end up stuck on one unimportant task for hours. I've rushed through meeting with someone important to me, but just thinking about what I wanted to say and what my plans were after and never really being present to them. I've run around from task to meeting to whatever over the course of the week, only to get to the end and not even really remember what I did. I found myself burnt out and trying to love others from a drained spirit, only to then snap at my husband or become really fixated on a small mistake. I found myself posturing myself as busy and accomplished and important to others. Because if I'm not constantly achieving or doing something, then what's my worth? Have you felt this way? Or have you felt like there's just so much rushing and busyness that you can't do or start anything? So you just scroll through social media again or start up another episode of The Office or go back to another video game or literally anything else to not have to face all the things that you feel like you need to be doing. And if you're like me, that means another round of Instagram and probably a true crime podcast. Because, you know, uh, learning about serial killers is clearly the balm an anxious mind needs. And the particular distraction doesn't matter as long as it does just that, distract you or keep you numb or keep you from feeling the stress of all the things you feel like you should be accomplishing or keep you from feeling the hurt and anxiety inside of you. Because who knows what's going to bubble up if we allow that to happen. 
what's making us do this? Why are we going through life simply reacting to what's happening, draining ourselves trying to do it all, but still coming up unsatisfied and joyless? Our lives are really complicated, and what goes into our internal worlds can be really complicated too. But there's one thing that can affect us, no matter what our life season is, or our job, our relational status, or whatever. And you might think, is it politics? Is it Twitter? Capitalism? The news? The ending of inception? Actually, the one thing that gets all of us, that affects our internal worlds and the satisfaction and joy of our life, is hurry. And now hurry has its place in our lives. Grabbing a child before they run into traffic or quickly moving to the side of the road when an ambulance comes speeding by. That hurry and the associated speed of decision-making and action brought on by an actual emergency is fine, even necessary. My brain trying to hustle me through an intense situation and process my car accident was actually a really helpful response in trying to keep me level-headed and calm, even if it led to me cleaning chips out of a totaled car. But in our world today, we've taken hurry to a whole other level. The hurry that sucks our souls and drains our lives is not that very limited emergency response hurry. It's the hurry that's steeped into our very way of being. It defines our existence, our meaning, our purpose. We've created the status marker of I'm busy, which means I'm important because I have so many things to do, so many people who need my time. I'm significant because my busyness proves my worth and value to the world. We look for more hours, more promotions, more ways to get ahead at work. Or at school, we're trying to take more classes every semester, get into research labs, apply for internships, all of these things so that we can prove to the world that we are worthy of jobs that will then put us into those same patterns of hurry. And even at home, we're trying to do it all, adding another side hustle, doing every project, getting our kids into every extracurricular and sport that we can, trying to do it all and get ahead and prove that we are achieving. And generally, these things aren't bad on their own. Some of those are good things. But we've started treating having a full schedule with absolutely no margin every single day of the week as a norm for us. When we suddenly don't have something to do, we feel antsy or underachieving. I remember in undergrad, working through my pre-med coursework, my classmates would brag about how little sleep they had gotten the night before with all of the studying and all of the extra work they had done. And I would sit there and feel legitimately bad about myself because I had actually gotten an adequate amount of sleep. And if I had time to be getting an adequate amount of sleep, surely I could be doing something else. Shouldn't I be adding another class or driving Lyft on the side for extra cash or doing more professional development or adding another club or something? And it doesn't even have to be a big life thing like work or school though. Every time someone suggests another show for me to watch, I crumble a little bit inside because when do I have time to be doing that? I already have a Netflix queue of shows and movies I want to watch, shelves of books I want to read, hikes I want to finish, stuff I want to do. There's not enough hours in the day for everything I feel like I should be doing or that I want to do. And then when I do have some extra time, the decision fatigue in trying to pick what is the best way to use my time right now sends me just scrolling through my phone again. How often do you find yourself going back to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or whatever, just eating away at your time and all these bursts throughout the day? But this shows us something really important about hurry. It has two sides, busyness and distraction. And now busyness on its own, when it's connected to purpose and intention and our calling, isn't bad, but it's that chronic need for it, the worship of productivity that we've put in place of real meaning. Think of the kind of advertisements we see. It's rich, successful people in these high-powered meetings and jet-setting around the world with nice cars and watches and electronics with fruit on them. Our ideal life is high-powered and important and busy. But the other side of hurry is distraction. 
We're so busy that we can't focus with this almost pathological need to always be watching something or listening to something or doing something and keeping ourselves, well, distracted. We can't be quiet or be still or feel our full emotions or simply be present to the moment and to the people around us. When is the last time that you didn't pull out your phone when you had to wait in line or wait for your Zoom class to start or wait at all? With these distractions, we're going through life just in a haze at best and actively drowning out any real thoughts or emotions at worst. And with all of this, we feel like we just don't have time to be with God, even if we say we believe and trust in Jesus fully. Hurry drives us towards achievements, towards hustling for more, or it drives us towards distraction and instant gratification. It rarely, if ever, pushes us towards God, towards resting in the love and presence of the one who created us. It doesn't push us towards connecting with a small group, towards reading the Bible, towards prayer, or even just being quiet with our own thoughts. Hurry doesn't encourage us to work through our internal struggles or to get honest about our emotions. It just has us skimming the surface of life, trying to look effortless and accomplished while inside we are struggling. Chronic stress and burnout now seem normal, even desirable with hurry. But this constant stress is so harmful to our mental and physical health. Our pace of life when we're hurried does nothing to help our mental well-being or encourage us to make the kinds of choices that would lead us into true joy and freedom because all of those things require time and attention and perseverance. And hurry instead has us leading shallow, reactive lives, just responding to what's happening around us without really thinking about what that means for us and our souls in the long term. And really, hurry is antithetical to most good things that we would want to cultivate in our lives. For example, take the fruits of the Spirit, which are all good and beautiful results of a life lived in close communion with God. There is not one of these fruits that is helped by hurry. In fact, hurry pretty much kills all of them right on the vine. For example, do you feel particularly loving when you're in a hurry? How joyful do you feel day to day? Do you feel peaceful when you're rushing between activities or when you're so stressed that you pick up your phone yet again to procrastinate? How easy is it for you to be patient in traffic or waiting in line or waiting at all? Are kindness and goodness your default when you are distracted and anxious? Do you find it easy to be faithful to your commitments and relationships when you're stressed and drained from your schedule? Do you act out of gentleness to your friends or your roommate or your spouse or your kids when you're running late or you're overbooked? How self-controlled are you when you're already on edge or running on empty? wanting to reach for your phone to scroll through social media or the news again, adding another thing to your Amazon shopping cart, grabbing another glass of wine or another cup of coffee or another energy drink just to drag yourself through the day. If we want to see the fruits of the Spirit in our lives, we have to address the pervasive nature of hurry. It will keep us from becoming the people we want to be and instead keep us on edge and distracted. And besides these very real mental and physical dangers of hurry, our spiritual lives are suffering. Deep, transformative discipleship takes time and attention, but hurry and distraction steal that same time and attention away from us. And maybe we think the solution is just having more time. If I had one extra hour in the day, I would totally read my Bible. If I had 10 minutes, an extra 10 minutes every day, I would pray. If I had just five more minutes before the kids woke up, I would practice silence. But the solution is not more time. Recently, Pastor Rich Vildas of New Life Fellowship made this comparison in how we spend our time. 
The average Christian spends an hour or two a week under the teaching of their local church, but as many as 13 hours a day consuming other media, listening to podcasts, scrolling through Twitter, Facebook, or watching cable news. And if you don't think that you're spending that much time watching TV or listening to podcasts or scrolling social media, think about this. The average American spends 705 hours a year on social media alone. And wait for it. 2,737 hours a year on TV. What are, we, what are we doing? We spend so much time on social media or TV or whatever, but we hardly want to make the time to spend just an hour or two with our community, with our friends at church every week. Maybe we've listened to all 200 episodes of our favorite podcast but we've never actually even read through the gospels. Maybe we spend hours a day watching or reading or listening to our news venue of choice, but we never stop to actually connect with the people around us, with our spouse, with our friends, with a small group about anything of real value in our lives. Maybe we've seen every single season of whatever cool new show is out there right now, but we've never learned to love prayer, to happily rest in the loving presence of God throughout our day. And technology and media are certainly not the only issues around hurry and distraction in our lives, but they are likely some of the biggest ones for us. And these benefit the most from stealing our attention and driving us to hurry up and consume more and more of it because there's profit on the line for them. And the advertising that's rampant in our social media feeds and in between snippets of all of our TV shows also feed that beast, encouraging us to do more and consume more and become more distracted. We say we have no time for church or a small group or silence or prayer, but often the real story is that the time we have is used poorly or used in a way that does is not, or it's used in a way that does not lead us to become the people we want to become. Are the ways we are using our time aligned with our values and the people that we want to become? Every system, including our schedules and habits, is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. Our days make up our years, and so how we spend those days matters to who we are becoming in the long run. We cannot become who we want to be without intention and practice, but our hurry sickness makes that really, really challenging. Thinking about who you are now and how you're spending your time, who do you think you'll be in a year, in five years, 10 years, 30 years? Are the patterns and ways of living you currently have shaping you into someone you want to be? Or are they shaping you into someone who is plagued by hurry and distraction? Shaping you into someone who has deep and satisfying relationships? Or into someone who is so easily annoyed and distracted that they can't maintain a friendship beyond a surface level? Someone who has stepped into their purpose or into someone who works all the time but feels no connection to their calling? Is it shaping you into someone who is able to stop and rest and delight or someone who simply cannot slow down? Is the way that you're spending your time shaping you into someone who is deeply connected to the true vine of Jesus or into someone who barely experiences the presence of God? And I imagine that we all want to live lives connected to that true vine, lives with purpose, with fulfilling relationships, with healthy rhythms of work and rest and delight, with compassion and presence to others. And I think that's still possible for us. So what is there to do? How do we do life differently? Pastor and author John Ortberg once asked his mentor, the renowned Christian author and teacher Dallas Willard, what he needed to do to become the person he wanted to become. And Willard paused and then said, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. 
These are both incredible thinkers who've taught and written a bunch of books and reflected on many, many potential obstacles to spiritual maturity and fruitfulness. And for them, it came down to hurry. Hurry, in the words of Dallas Willard, is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. We might think that if only there was more time in the day, then I would feel better. I would get to everything, but it wouldn't help. We would simply fill it with more and more things, even really good things, but we'd end up right back where we started, feeling like there wasn't enough time. And frankly, we don't use the time we do have all that well. And so the solution is not to add more of it, if that was even possible. We might think that if we just didn't have this problem or that one, we'd get this all figured out. But God doesn't promise us a problem-free life. Instead, we're told that we will have many trials and sorrows in this world. In other words, we will have problems. We might think, well, if I just didn't have these limits, if I didn't have these classes, or if I didn't have this job, or this spouse, or these kids, or this house, or this family background, or these spiritual gifts, or this issue, if I just didn't have that, then it would fix everything, and I would feel perfect. But God is the one who created us, including our particular gifts and limits, and we find God's call for us in those very limitations. This is not simply a lack of time issue or limitations issue or even a schedule issue. It's a heart one. Our disordered hearts lead to disordered, hectic, distracted lives. How we spend our time matters. In Ephesians 5, we read, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. The world gives us lots of ways to organize the clutter of our lives, to do more, to be more, to simply ignore or put off anything that's inconvenient or messy or difficult. But this path is not leading us towards lives that are purposeful, meaningful, or joyful. They're not leading us closer to lives marked by the love and grace of Christ. And Jesus was very aware of how much hurry would try to attack our spiritual lives, both pulling us from God entirely, and when it can't do that, rendering our following of Jesus fruitless or even draining. In the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, Jesus teaches about a farmer scattering seeds, representing people's responses to hearing about the good news of the kingdom of God. And some of those seeds get picked up by birds and don't make it anywhere. But there's this group of seeds that Jesus focuses on who do make it into the ground and sprout. He says, other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shower, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun. And since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Without deep roots, without those consistent practices connecting us back to God, we don't have the internal resources to endure when life gets hard. And without some intentionality, the distractions and worry of this world will choke out any of the spiritual fruit that does start to grow. Jesus didn't pretend that hurry or busyness or distraction just weren't a thing. He directly addressed its power to pull us away from him and his goodness. In Luke, we see this really important interaction with his friend Martha. Martha is frantic, harried, trying to knock out this huge to-do list as she's preparing her home for Jesus and his disciples. And she's doing good stuff. Hospitality is a good and often forgotten gift in our culture. But this hurry sickness in her is not helping her to get closer to Jesus. And in trying to do a bunch of good things, Martha is flustered, she's grumpy, she's snapping at her sister Mary. And all of her rushing is keeping her from being present to what actually matters. And Jesus responds to her irritation and anxiety with great gentleness. He says, my dear Martha, You are worried and upset over all these details, 
There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha, slow down. It's okay. I know you're worried. I know there's a lot to do, but I want your presence. I want you to just be with me the way Mary is learning to just be with me. And that's the start of unhurrying, learning to be with Jesus. Imagine if Jesus was just as addicted to hurry as we are, writing out his to-do list while people are trying to ask him big questions about God or snapping at his disciples when yet another sick person interrupts their meal with a request for healing or just zoning out when crowds of weak, unimportant, poor people are clamoring around him for his help. And if that sounds ridiculous, that's, it should. That's simply not the Jesus we see in the Bible and thank God for that. And while Jesus does give some explicit teaching on hurry, much of his most profound teaching on this subject is found just in how he lived his life. We tend to look at just the direct teaching parts of the gospels and all of that is very, very good. But ultimately the gospels are narratives, stories of Jesus's life and ministry. Think of a biography or a documentary on someone's life. Often we watch them because we want to learn more about that person and maybe emulate the way they lived or learn what their patterns were so we don't fall into them and don't end up like that person. And the gospels are way more important than any biography of a normal human person, but we can still learn a ton in them from Jesus's rhythms and habits within his life. And to be very clear, these are not just quick self-help hacks or a guide just to happier living. These are powerful stories of Jesus's life that show us how to live in loving relationship with God. As an example, let's take a look at just a small section of Mark 6. We read the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. And he said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. And Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. The disciples get back from their ministry, all excited about everything they've been doing. And Jesus says, let's go off on our own and rest. Jesus doesn't try to hype them up or say like, good game, get back out there, but encourages them to come away, to be quiet, to rest with him. They are so busy that they barely have time to eat. And Jesus wants them to have that time to recover and be refreshed. And it's not that their teaching or healing or any of their ministry work are a bad thing. In a way, the apostles are this really good kind of busy where their lives are full and that fullness is connected to purpose and meaning. But even all that good stuff wears them down and Jesus wants them to take a breather before they hop right back into that busy rhythm. But then we get an interruption. Crowds of people coming to Jesus for his teaching, desperately in need of his presence. How do you respond when you think you're about to get a break and then yet another thing comes up? An urgent request or your friend really needs someone to talk to or your child wants you to comfort them. And often this is where our afraid ends really bubble up to the surface. We make snappy comments or we're grouchy or we just sit there and stew in silent resentment of that interruption. All of this is symptoms of hurry and drained emotional resources. But Jesus responds differently. We read that he had compassion on these people and he pauses from going off to rest to be present to them to teach them, and later in that chapter, to feed all 5,000 plus of them. And I don't know about you, but that is generally not how I respond to being interrupted when I think I'm about to peace out for the day. 
Jesus must be doing something differently. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida, where he sent the people home. After telling everyone goodbye, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And after a very long day, Jesus doesn't binge a bunch of ice cream or Netflix or even just pass out. He goes off to be alone and to pray. Not before saying goodbye to everyone though, which I think is just a really sweet detail in this passage. Jesus' compassion and presence to others continues to come through here. Now, it'd be really easy to think, wow, Jesus is just so spiritual, going off and having this all-night prayer vigil by himself. I could just never be like that. And you're not wrong about the intensity and commitment of Jesus' spiritual life, but it does miss some of the point. Jesus is going off to pray by himself in the night because that's when he finally had time. Remember, this has been a super long day of teaching and feeding the 5,000 and all of that. And even then, he has to create space to be on his own and pray, literally sending his disciples off in a boat so he could have that time. Jesus knows that his busy life and ministry require more time in solitude, in prayer, in connection to his father, not less. And just in this one chapter, we already learn a lot about what made up Jesus's rhythms. Rest, silence, solitude, prayer. Out of these practices, he's able to be present to others, calm and compassionate in the face of interruptions, able to do great and beautiful miracles while still remaining humble, gentle, and kind. And very little of that was explicit teaching. Jesus simply does it and says, come with me. And we often want to skip right to doing stuff like Jesus did, but we have to learn to become more like Jesus first. And to do that, we have to spend time with him and figure out how he lived to become who he was. And you might be thinking, Jesus is God though, so doesn't he have kind of an unfair advantage here? And sure, that's true. But Jesus is also fully human. And so both his direct teachings and what he modeled in his life among us on earth is rich with insights in how to live connected to the true vine. In John 15, Jesus tells his followers, abide in me. This is more than just intellectual agreement or a casual dabble in the way of Jesus. It's a whole new way of living, learning to abide in him. And we can start to see what this abiding might look like in our lives with this question. How would Jesus live if he were me, if he were in my particular context in life? If Jesus were a student, I imagine he would make sure to get enough sleep so that he could be mentally and emotionally present throughout the day. And also because Jesus loved sleep. His disciples literally had to wake him up in the middle of a boat-shaking storm. This was a man who took his sleep seriously. And I also imagine Jesus would invest in his key friendships and a good support system, and that he would learn to say no to too many commitments that would start to make his life feel hectic and pull him away from time spent with God and with others. If Jesus were a parent, I imagine he would spend a lot of quality time with his kids, phones put away, and everyone present to the moment. I imagine that he would carve out time to be alone and to process his emotions fully so that he could then model that to his children. I imagine that Jesus would make intentional time to connect with his spouse on a regular basis, helping their marriage to flourish. If Jesus had roommates, which, you know, maybe he did. I don't know what his living arrangement with the disciples was. I imagine that he would be gentle and compassionate with them and that he would resolve conflict with them well when the situation called for it. If Jesus wasn't an inner rabbi and had like a normal person job, I imagine he would work to build up his coworkers and celebrate their successes without gossiping or becoming resentful and that he'd have strong boundaries between his work and home life. 
And we could go on with examples like this, but that's the idea. Consider your particular context and season. Think of how Jesus might live that out and try to follow that example in your life. How would Jesus live if he were me? And if you're unsure of what that might look like, that's okay. Learning to be with Jesus is a lifelong endeavor. And it's not something we're going to master in just a couple of weeks or months. It takes time. But right now, we simply have to answer the invitation that Jesus offers. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. And this invitation is to us, the tired, the burnt out, those who are carrying heavy burdens through this life. Jesus offers us rest and to teach us how to live life differently. But it does seem a little strange that what he offers is a yoke. If you remember a few weeks ago when Megan, the other taller Megan, not me, spoke on our church's value of transformation, a yoke is how you carry something heavy. But it's an odd choice to give a bunch of weary and burdened people more work, not an all-inclusive vacation or a new mattress or even a face mask. But that's the really beautiful thing about Jesus's yoke. It's a far better gift than we realize. A scholar on the Gospel of Matthew puts it this way, but Jesus realizes that the most restful gift he can give the tired is a new way to carry life, a fresh way to bear responsibilities. Realism sees that life is a succession of burdens. We cannot get away from them. Thus, instead of offering escape, Jesus offers equipment. Jesus means that obedience to his Sermon on the Mount, his yoke, will develop in us a balance and a way of carrying life that will give more rest than the way we have been living. Jesus doesn't offer us an escape. He offers us equipment. He offers us a new way to carry life and its burdens. And all of the productivity hacks and self-care tips and the easy escapes and distractions of this world cannot give us what Jesus freely offers, a way of living that truly gives rest for our souls. And I don't know about you, but soul deep rest after this past year, especially, sounds pretty amazing to me. So what does this yoke look like? If we want the life that Jesus offers, we have to adopt the lifestyle that Jesus modeled for us in the gospels. It's more than just checking a box. We have to adopt the rhythms and habits of Jesus. In his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, on which we've based this series, Pastor John Mark Comer outlines this process. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what Jesus did. And we got to keep that order in mind. We can't do the things that Jesus did, whether that's acts of mercy or service or teaching or justice or whatever, without becoming more like him. And we can't become more like him without first spending intentional time with Jesus. And these aren't just patterns of legalism or checking off boxes on a to-do list, but a way to live that allows us to rest in God's love and be free of the tyranny of the urgent in our lives. Adopting the rhythms of Jesus helps us to avoid becoming burdened by the heavy, hurried yoke of this world. And taking on Jesus' yoke means learning to practice the habits that form Jesus' life, also known as the spiritual disciplines. And these disciplines, or if the word discipline is making you check out of what I'm saying right now, just think of the word practices instead. These disciplines or these practices help us to access power. For example, 
I really want to hike up Mount Kimball in the Catalina Mountains, but I am in no shape to be doing that right now. But with practice, like doing other hikes consistently to build up my strength, I will steadily be able to go farther and higher without my lungs bursting and my legs turning into jello. With steady practice and discipline, I will be able to do something and climb something that I could not do previously. I will have accessed new power through this practice. With spiritual disciplines, the practices of Jesus, we are able to live life differently than we could before under our own power. And over the next four weeks here at DR, we're gonna be digging into what exactly these practices look like. So the first application point for today is to keep coming back the next few weeks. Make church a regular part of your rhythm. And after all, going to the synagogue regularly was a part of Jesus's life. And we're trying to follow him as best we can in our own individual contexts. But starting this week, though, I do have a practice or two that you can try out. Start by taking an honest look at how you spend your time right now. Write out a time budget of what exactly you're spending your time on. Not what you would ideally be spending your time on, but how you're actually using it. And if you want to get really honest with yourself, pull out your screen time report on your phone and add in all the time you're spending on your various apps. And then you can maybe ask your spouse or your kids or your roommates or whoever is around you frequently and see what their assessment is of how you spend your time so you can get really honest about it. And once you've made that time budget, take some time to reflect on it. Is this pattern of life leading you closer to God? Is it leading you closer to a person you actually want to become? One year, five years, 10 years, 30 years from now, assuming this same trajectory, do you like the person that you're becoming? And having reflected on that, consider what edits you might need to make so that you can ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. What habits do you have in place that are encouraging hurry, distraction, numbing or disconnection rather than the fruits of the spirit? And how can you start changing those habits? A simple change that you can start is to put some hard boundaries around technology use. For the past few months, my husband Tyler and I have started putting our phones to bed. Before our bedtime, our phones go on their chargers out in the living room and they do not come into the bedroom with us while we're getting ready for bed or while we're sleeping. And we've also put in screen time limits on our phone that lock up all but a few apps during a certain window, generally at night. And it makes it harder for us to stay on our phones really late or to go to them first thing in the morning. And it's a small nudge, but it's helped us to start reducing the hold that technology and its associated distractions have on our lives in a really practical way. And if we want to avoid falling back in our old habits or just deciding that we don't have any time, we need to look at how we're spending our time now and make some intentional changes. I can't just add a small group or Sabbath or spend more time in silence and simultaneously spend all of that time on Instagram. We have to make real choices about where we are placing our time and attention or that same time and attention will once again be stolen by all the seemingly urgent posts and notifications and whatever that pop up throughout our day. Remember, we're learning a whole new way of living, not just a quick productivity hack. It will take time, intention, and faithfulness. And that starts with getting honest about how we use our time if we wanna really start to adopt Jesus's way of living. And as we work through what the core practices of Jesus's yoke look like over these next few weeks, I hope and pray that even now you start to experience the rest and joy that Jesus invites us into when we choose to do life with him. His invitation to us to learn from him and to rest with him is good. And it's far more helpful in learning to shoulder the burdens of this life than anything the world has to offer. 
In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let's choose that abundant life today. Let's work to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives, to accept Jesus' invitation into a rich and satisfying life, to learn what it means to follow his unforced rhythms of grace together. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your invitation to the weary and to the burdened God your offer of rest and a new way to carry life gives us so much hope and comfort in a world that is based around our achievements and our rushing and our hurrying, God. I pray that you help each of us this week to start to stop and to learn to rest in you, to trust you enough to know that the world will keep going without our hurrying and striving, Lord. You've got it. Help us to rest in that truth, to find joy and freedom and life in your presence, God. We love you. We thank you for Jesus, for the life that he modeled for us, that we may have a life that is truly satisfying and joyful and meaningful, God. We love you in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Over the next few minutes, we're going to go into a time of reflection. So a song is going to play. And I encourage you to really take this time and start to think about that time budget. Think about how you're spending your time. Think of what it would mean for you to start unhurrying your life even now. What could that look like for you? And in these next few minutes as well, I encourage you to either use the link in the chat or through the Bible app and fill out our communication card uh, just to give us some information um, on what prayer requests you have, what commitments you want to make to help kind of keep yourself accountable and start to apply these things in your life. Um, But more than anything, take a few minutes to slow down, be present to the moment and what God has to say to you in this time. Thank you.
on your mind I'll be your friend on the sea Megan challenged us to consider how we use the time we have and who it is that our habits and our practices are shaping us into in five, 10, or 30 years from now. But what if you knew that you didn't have 30 years or 10 years or five years left? If you didn't even have one day left, What if you had one last night to spend with the people closest to you? One last night to pass on whatever you still have left to pass on. One last night to secure your legacy. One last night with these men and these women who have spent the last three years of their life following you, sitting at your feet, listening to you, learning from you, witnessing you do great and miraculous things. And you have to prepare them to carry on your mission from the small backwater town that you're all from out into your country, into your continent, and out into the whole world. Okay, that last one, that's pretty specific. But imagine what would you do if you were in Jesus' position the night before he was arrested, beaten, and crucified on the cross? I know Megan said to ask, what would Jesus do if he were me? But go with me for a second. What would you do on your last night with the disciples? If ever there was a time to bemoan the lack of time, if ever more time was the solution, what would you do if you were Jesus? Would you warn them all about what is to come? Would you sneak out of town to buy yourself some more time with them? Would you take a few hours to drill in like the SparkNotes version of the key points of your message? Would you have them practice teaching and evangelism and and role play with one another? If ever there was a time for Jesus to be in a hurry, it is this night when he knows that Judas is going to betray him, when he knows that the soldiers are on their way to arrest him, when he knows that the Jewish leaders are going to give him a sham trial, and when he knows that the people are going to reject him and that his best and closest friends are going to deny him. But Jesus did not hurry. Jesus did not worry about how much time he had. Jesus did not try and squeeze in all of the last minute teachings and miracles that he could. And instead, Jesus slowed down, washed their feet, celebrated the Passover meal with them, and he gave them a way to remember. Jesus gave them a meal and a command to come back to this moment and remember him through this bread and this wine. Instead of being in a hurry, Jesus made this time holy. And so we too slow down and we return to this moment 
we pause and we take the time to remember to meet Jesus back at the table and to receive from him the bread and the wine. So I invite you, wherever you are at, to retrieve your communion elements. It's okay if you don't have bread or wine uh, available to you right now, because God is great. God is transcendent and God can meet you in goldfish crackers and apple juice. But let us take the time to come together in this moment united with the church across space and time through this simple meal. And let me read from Jesus' own words in Matthew as we commune together. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. And then he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. There is no need to be in a hurry, but instead allow this time to be holy. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Christ, I thank you that in these last, the last moments you had before the crucifixion, before your arrest and betrayal, the last moments with your disciples, you did not rush, did not hurry. You took this time to slow down, to pause, to give us the bread and the wine. And I do thank you, Lord, that this is not the end. That does not end after your death, but that there's the resurrection, that there is the life after death, Lord, that you conquer death that you invite us to celebrate the feast to come with you in this bread and this wine. I pray that we not be in a rush, Lord, that we not be in a hurry, Lord, but instead we stop, we pause, and we sit with you in this time and we allow you to make this time holy. In your holy name I pray, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Every Sunday at Damascus Road, we take time to worship God with our money. God has given us incredible gifts and he's tasked us with stewarding his resources. And part of that involves giving to your local church and to God's work in the world. So for those of you who consider Damascus Road your home, this is just a small reminder that everything we have is from him and that we're called to steward that well. If you're just joining us online, you don't consider Damascus Road your home, you're giving to another church, another organization, that's awesome. We're so grateful to you for that. It matters to us that you follow God's prompting for what you should do with your money. We're just glad that you joined us this morning. But for those of us who consider Damascus Road our home, this is your chance to be reminded to make sure that you are giving of the resources that God has entrusted to you. Additionally, we'll be back next week for the second week of our Ruthless Elimination of Hurry series. My wife, Megan, is speaking. The topic is Turn It Off, which is about the the beauty and importance of silence in a very noisy world. So I encourage you to come back, learn how to really tune into God and how to be in the silence and practice that a little bit more. And of course, we want you to join us and continue worshiping with us this morning with our curated YouTube worship playlist. If you're on our playlist already, like I talked about already this morning, It'll just start as soon as I pray. So I encourage you to stay, to worship, to just pour out your heart to God together, even if we're apart, and worship him this morning. Let me pray as we end our service. Heavenly Father, we admit and we confess that we are often hurried, and sometimes it's not even the world around us. Sometimes it's just our internal world. It's our hearts that can get so easily disordered. We want to align with you 
We want to be present to you. We want to give you time and attention. And we want people to experience us as non-anxious presences. We're being transformed because of your spirit in us. And we know that you don't just wave a magic wand, that you invite us into a whole new way of life, that we need to reorder what we're doing so that we become more and more like you, Jesus. Spirit, work in us, empower us to become more than we could apart from you. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name I pray. Amen. Let's worship together.